looking at opening hands, it seems like looks to me like Brad went ahead and mulliganed once, but from from my vantage point, looks like exactly what you want out of a, an opening hand from Jump Creativity. You've got a couple of lands, some interactive pieces in Thoughtseize and Fatal Push. The Fable of the Mirror Breaker is going to be a great way to uh, sort of bridge the gap to the mid game, and then your payoff in Creativity. Totally, really, really good hand from Brad. He's going to just be kind of sweating the third and fourth land drop. The card he would really love to see is Renin Six because that would allow him to make his land drops uncontested for the rest of the game. Um, what do you think about Brad not casting Thoughtseize on turn one? I'm I I think it I think it makes a fair amount of sense. The only the, the only real card that I would say I'm very afraid of from Brad's side that Arya can play on turn two is Agatha's Soul Cauldron. And unfortunately here, right, you see that Soul Cauldron and and it's kind of a punish for for Brad not taking the line to Thoughtseize on turn one. But more, uh, I think usually if Arya plays a Young Wolf instead of a mana-producing creature like a Delighted Halfling on turn one, that means you don't have to worry about Grist or Yawgmoth until the third or fourth turns of the game, and maybe you can go get that raucous theater on turn one like Brad did to try and make your land drop, and then Thoughtseize on the second turn to hit something like a Grist or Yawgmoth before it comes down. Unfortunately for Brad, uh, Arya did have the, the card that can punish that in Agatha's Soul Cauldron. Right, so Brad taking great pains to get maximum surveil value. I also, it occurs to me that maybe if he had a hand that was more centered on persist and less centered on indomitable creativity, maybe he would have considered a different choice there. But it, this looks, well, <laughs> I was going to say it looks okay in that he can go for the tap land and then turn two thoughts, use away your grist angle. But... The Soul Cauldron almost blocks Brad from taking the, the Grist. So a little bit of a uh, damned if you do, damned if you don't situation for Brad Nelson. Yeah, that that's um th that's one of the big things about the addition of Agatha's Soul Cauldron to the Golgari Yogmoth deck. If a Soul Cauldron hits the battlefield for, for Arya, it makes interacting with Grist and Yogmoth significantly less profitable, right? Arya can just eat one of those cards with the Soul Cauldron, and now all of her creatures are Grists or Yawgmoths or whatever they need to be. And and I think that, that that really, right, that really goes to show that that punish here by by not thought seizing on turn one. Now most of Brad's interaction is just kind of blanked by the Soul Cauldron. Yeah, so he decided to just take his medicine and take away the Grist, um, you know, if Arya puts the counter on <laughs> Brad's, Brad's message, messaging us from beyond the grave. Not quite beyond the grave. He's He's got a few more turns before he's there, but he, he, <laughs> he wrote in his notepad, I have no idea how this works. Uh, well, I, I could tell you uh, from being, having been on both sides of the Soul Cauldron that it almost always works the way you don't want it to. <laughs> as the <laughs> opponent so the grist is gonna is gonna deliver its loyalty abilities to the young wolf the one saving grace for brad is that the young wolf can now be killed by a single removal spell like that fatal push uh but then you know that's one more creature in the graveyard for for Arya to then make a another creature with plus, plus one counter so it's gonna be tough yeah i think at this point it's I think Brad's best route to victory is just hoping he can make those third and fourth land drops. And right, we see him, we see him find the the third land here to to be able to potentially deploy a Fable of the Mirror Breaker. Um, and I think his best way back in this game is to manage to set up a creativity for one, and then maybe follow it with a creativity for two, with all the tokens that the the Fable of the Mirror Breaker pr can produce to just try and overwhelm what what uh what Grist under the Soul Cauldron can do by just making more Archons than Arya can overcome. And, and if we look at Arya's hand, the Soul Cauldron and the Grist are about all she has going on with three lands in hand. I don't know that there's that there's lots else that Arya can can really do to, to fight through an Archon. Okay, I like it. So you set us up, Jake, by saying that this Jun Creativity deck has 
some things in common with traditional Jun, like what I played. You know, you've got your Thoughtseize, your Fatal Push, your Fable, you're, you're, you're trying to manage your opponent's resources. But here we might see the other angle where Brad goes, okay, that's not working anymore. I can't outgrind Soul Cauldron and Grist. So now I'm going to turn my sights to the combo and try to go over the top. And that's why this creativity deck is is a, a, a an effective strategy in a multi dimensional deck. Exactly, it's it's something that actually I think it has a fair amount in common with the Yogmoth deck in 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 so much as they're both. Combo decks in one sense of the word, right? It's, you have the creativity angle in creativity, you have the Yogg-Moth loops involving sacrificing undying creatures to, to remove the plus one plus one counters from other undying creatures to, to take sort of an unfair angle. But one of the reasons that we've seen creativity and Yogg-Moth stick around in the modern format for as long as they have is both of them can just win the game fairly, right? Jun Creativity has Fables and Renin Sixes, to just sort of grind through what its opponent's doing, and sometimes the Yogmoth deck just attacks you with a bunch of dinky creatures, and that's enough, right? We already we see that Brad's already down to thirteen, and hopefully for his sake, there's an Archon on the way. But even then, right? It's it's not that hard to see a world where Arya sacrifices an insect token to the uh, Archon trigger, and then the Young Wolf can act as a Grist to remove two loyalty counters, sacrifice a creature, and blow up the Archon itself. So we're seeing some of that that blend of unfair and fair out of both of these decks, and I think that, that that's a big draw to this style of, of deck in modern. We should focus for a moment on Arya's tough decision on, on the previous turn. So careful viewers might notice that the, the Young Wolf used the plus ability of Grist, and Arya milled over a Gilded Goose, which is, a, you know, one more precious creature in the graveyard. So if she had wanted to just put her foot on the gas and go as hard as possible at building her own board, she could have main phase, exiled the Gilded Goose, put a plus plus one counter on something, and then continue using Grist ability. But... Remember that we know Brad's hand and Arya has not yet gotten a glimpse of Brad's hand. So she's probably thinking, okay, Brad is finally getting access to Fable Chapter 2. He might have an Archon Persist type of hand where I really want to protect myself from that with, with the Soul Cauldron. So she, you know, thanked, tanked for a while on her turn and decided to make uh, the play that that uh, she decided to make like a significant sacrifice in order to play around persist here. But then once once Brad does not discard Archon to the chapter two, she decides it's safe to go ahead and, and ambush during blocks with the two, three delighted halfling makes total sense. an indomitable creativity for two looks uh, i i have to assume it's targeting the dwarf token and i'm wondering if it is it targeting the agatha soul cauldron oh yep, it is boy. Targeting the agatha soul cauldron is that a good play jake talk us through that one i i think it's a good play i mean you you're going it it solves some amount of the problem of aria managing to dis to use the gris down tick that is sort of funneled through the Agatha Soul Cauldron into the Young Wolf to remove the Archon that Brad's going to produce. And instead gives Arya a random creature or artifact out of her out of her library. And in the case of the Golgari Yogmoth deck, there are a lot of cards that are kind of blank, right? If if Arya hits a Young Wolf, that's not all that exciting. Now we see her hit an Orcish Bowmasters, which is one of those cards that can can help slog through the Archon's triggers a little bit, but it certainly is not as high impact at this point as the uh, as the Soul Cauldron was, for sure. Yeah, super cool. I mean, that's a tough play because there's, there's an element of randomness involved. And also, you know, Brad, in my opinion, made it a significant sacrifice there in using the treasure because that that's something you could have used to Fatal Push, or to set up a, an extra um, use of indomitable creativity later, but it looks like it's working out nicely for him. Um, you know, Arya lost access to the Grist, 
didn't hit super well off the random uh, creativity spike and then drew a blank. So, you know, now what? <laughs> It, certainly on this board, it's it's a blank. I, I think that, that it is worth looking at Boseju as uh, a way to break up what could be the best possible turn here from Brad in Bitter Reunion can give the reflection of Kihijiki haste, which would let Brad make another Archon. Here, the Boseju will at least help break that up if that's the line that Brad goes for. But I still think, yeah, like you said, it's, it's not fixing the problem of there's an Archon on the battlefield. And, and that's... I think if I'm in Aria seat, that my my high priority is what can I do to fix that? A good play from Brad. The Bowmasters is uh, annoying against both Bitter Reunion and Archon, but looks like he is not going for your play of the. Oh, okay. I guess that the the mana situation is is a little bit off there, um, but. Yeah, he would have needed one more to do Fatal Push and Bitter Reunion and Haste yeah. and Activate Reflection. Here we see a good draw for Brad, given what he's got in hand right now. Bitter Reunion discarding Archon is no longer just a... Uh, is no longer just a maybe I'll draw Persist. It has the Persist. Uh, we, we've got the Persist in hand, and I'm... I, yeah, I figure we just see Brad go for it now, and and just at this point, try and slam the door by making a second copy of Archon of Cruelty. Boy, for a game that started out looking pretty ugly for Brad Nelson, uh, he has he has well and truly turned it around. Uh, Arya definitely stagnated a bit with, with a good start. And then, I mean, I think after turn two or three of the game, she only only drew lands. So wasn't yeah. able to, to really press that early advantage. But... Um, yeah, a fascinating game already right off the bat. Yeah, it's it's certainly certainly from Aria's standpoint, it feels feels a little bit bad to to start that far ahead and then have things go go south. But but I think that um, I think that that what we saw there is creativity. A lot of the time has the capability of being the bigger deck in the sense that. Archon as a singular entity is significantly more powerful than any one card in Arya's deck, right? Arya, Arya the onus is on Arya. I don't know, Jake. There's Young Wolf. <laughs> young Wolf drills versus Archon. <laughs> I I think, and and I don't know. You're the Hall of Famer. You know, you probably know better than I do. But I think that Archon hits a little bit harder than Young Wolf. Now we're we're gonna see Young Wolf come down earlier, and that that certainly could make a difference. But what do you what do you think from uh, both of these opening hands, Reed? Who do you think uh, who who I'm gonna I'm gonna put you on the spot and ask you to to pick a favorite with wildly not enough information. Um, that, so the key card that I want to keep my eye on here is Renin Six because. You know, this is now game number five that that we're watching with Jun Creativity uh, this evening, and I think just the total number of resources and hitting the land drops is so huge for this deck. It really allows it to snowball, and then of course, Arya's key card here, one of one of her key cards is Fulminator Mage. So if the Red and Six is able to get on the battlefield and stick around, that's going to be great for Brad. Now he had yet again an interesting choice with these land drops he didn't play that enters the battlefield tapped green source on turn one so he may have to wait on the red and six um but it seems like he'll probably be able to get that in time before um things become too dire he even takes away the fulminator mage with thought sees. by the way welcome to all raiders uh coming from jim davis's channel stick around to see uh, this is a win and in for top four for anyone just joining in. We've, we've also got periodic giveaways coming uh, at the end of every match. So this is good fun. If, if, if you don't have plans for this evening, hang out with us, watch some modern. It's going to be great. Yeah. So here we see a little bit of awkwardness from 
Brad's draw from from Brad's draw here, right? We see him drawing all three of these new surveil lands that that have been that are a pretty recent addition to modern and and right. You certainly would like to if you're Brad be able to cast your Renin six on turn two or, or or whatnot. But Reed, how how do you feel that the uh that that these surveil lands have impacted the modern format so far? Have you been have you been generally pretty happy with them? Have you felt they're a little clunky as we see Arya? deploy a surveil land of her own as long as uh, as well as a grist to, to start start like you said snowballing with those resources in her own way as opposed to as opposed to brad's they're cool uh the surveil lands uh, when you and i played i felt that they gave you a big advantage in the game three because you know we were both just kind of sitting there making land drops not doing much sometimes ren and six was involved and you you had three surveil lands uh, i think it was at least three and I only had one. So I, I, you know, I was one and done. And I was like, oh man, I wish I had more of these to search for and filter my draws uh, in these long games. And it's one of the cool things about modern that it can go very fast or it can go very slow. And in, in those medium to slow length games, having access to a surveil land in your mana base to find off the fetch lands just so powerful. Now, Reed, I'm interested in, in in picking your brain a little bit about this play that that Brad just made. We saw an end step lightning bolt target Gris to put the Gris to one loyalty, and then Ren and Six came down and had had a pretty interesting decision point. Either Ren and Six can tick up, get out of range of Arya's creatures for the turn, and pick up a wooded foothills, or tick down and answer the Gris, deal that that final point of loyalty, and then likely succumb to an attack from the Young Wolf and the Insect. Which what what do you think of that play? What what are you thinking about that play if you're in Brad's seat here? Well, it's one of those classic moments where it's do you play the Jund resource management game plan or do you play the combo game plan? Given Brad's hand, where he has both Bitter Reunion and Fable of the Mirror Breaker, it seems like the additional cards in hand, the additional resources, are gonna be used to such great effect that I kind of like his choice. You know, he, he picks up the land right away. So that's immediately one more card in hand. Then the red and six survives the turn. So it's another permanent on the battlefield, another land to his hand the following turn, soaking up damage, setting him up to use these discard effects. Uh, so it, it makes sense to, well, in both of the games that we've seen, emphasize the combo element of the deck because that's what's going to work against Arya's super resilient threats in Golgari Yogmoth. Oh, I think that makes a lot of sense. And here, uh, it it looked like Brad had it had had sort of locked everything up with the Ren and Six tick down on this turn after making an Archon of Cruelty to get to put the Grist down to uh, uh to get the Grist out of range of yes to get the Grist out of range of activating to remove the Archon. But here we see Arya top deck a Court of Calling to put the namesake Yogmoth Ram Physician into play, and that's. That is not you that that is rarely where you want to be if you're playing against Golgari Yogmoth is your opponent putting the card Yogmoth onto the battlefield. Super cool turn because you know at face value, there's a single Archon of Cruelty against a Gris with two counters. So you're like, okay, you know, Arya's gonna use the minus two ability and kill off the Archon. But immediately upon drawing the Court of Calling, she plus one to the Grist to get one more body on the battlefield and then courted for Yogmoth. I think correctly identifying that this is such a strong position, tapped out opponent, 16 life points, robust board. Arya could basically pay 14 life. And if she finds Zulaport Cutthroat or Court of Calling at any point in those top 14 cards, she immediately wins the game by fully comboing off. Now, interestingly, mm -hmm. that's not a, a, a uh, deterministic kill. It's just a very likely kill. And after, you know, five or six draws, she'd only found lands. But Brad went ahead and conceded anyway because he just, he didn't feel like the, the odds were in his favor there and he, he wasn't willing to sit through it. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's certainly an interesting point. I don't, I, I'm, I'm curious what, I, I saw Arya scroll a little bit through her hand and we did see that cutthroat there. So I think that that was it, but. Oh, my uh, mistake. Uh, okay. I must've, I must've not seen that. No, nah, it's I. It's also possible that Arya could have won, even without drawing into anything. Just you know, six minus one counters on, on your Archon, kill your 
um, kill your Ren and Six, and then you know have an overwhelming board. Yeah. So it, that that was that was her game for sure. But uh, very cool. Both decks again showing the combo element, the surprise kill. Here we're gonna see Reed keep a or uh, I'm sorry, Brad, excuse me, keep a very land heavy hand, which. I think is generally okay from the Jun creativity side, right? We, we've we talked at length about how important getting those lands into play, getting those resources into play is from the creativity side. So so I like this I like this from, from Brad's side. Tell me a little bit about Arya's opener. Arya's opener is, I guess, just doing the Yawgmoth thing where it's not particularly explosive, it's not particularly disruptive, but what it is, is very resilient. And that's actually going to be important since Brad's key early play here is Fatal Push. But Arya wants to build out with Young Wolves, maybe get the Zulaport Cutthroat out there, and then either tap four lands for a Yawgmoth or Court of Calling for something to uh, set up the combo and or bridge the gap. We're going to see, like you had mentioned, those surveil lands in in modern really making a huge difference, helping helping fix some of Brad's uh, some of the inconsistencies in Brad's draw, given how land heavy it is. Right, you you see a land on top, you get rid of it, you fix you fix that half of it. Oh, and here's an archon in the graveyard making persist a a very live draw from Brad's side. On this turn, Arya's going to be able to Court of Calling for two. Is there anything cool that can enter the battlefield for, for X equals two or less? Um, pulling up Arya's deck list right here, we've got, uh, as far as bullets go, we have one Strangleroot Geist, uh, a Haywire Might could, uh, could enter the battlefield. I don't think that either of those are all that exciting. And with the draw of Orcish Bowmasters, I think... We're likely to see that be the be the call from Arya's side, especially because it the Orcish Bowmasters can kill the Dwarven Mind Dwarf in response to a Transmogrifier creativity to help neutralize that combo game plan that we've been that we've been talking about. And and thus Brad's gonna just go ahead and wait as well. With the creativity in hand, you can try and set up multiple dwarves at once to make multiple uh uh to attempt to make multiple archons. Yeah, boy, nice play from Brad. I I, I envisioned a world, uh, you know, kind of like watching NASCAR for the car for the the car crashes, where like maybe Brad just goes for it there. He goes for the dwarf, the dwarf and the transmogrify and gets blown out by the Bowmasters. But this looks like it's gonna work out nicely for him because if Arya hits a land, she's gonna play Yawgmoth, and Brad is ready for that with fetch land plus fatal push. And then the opportunity to untap and maybe have have creativity for two. So this is a game where it's not just about the cards that are drawn, but also how each player is going to choose to play them. Those are the best kinds of games, right? That's exactly what that's the exact kind of excitement we're looking we we have here on Midgo Masters. One game to one, playing for a top four slot. Both players have lots of the, the resources they need at their disposal to win any given game. And it's going to come down to who makes those decisions just a little bit better, who who can get things to line up a little bit in their favor, which is right. That's that's as much as you can ask for out of a out of a out of a quarterfinals match. Great comment in chat that it can actually be a downside for Arya that she has Zulaport Cutthroat in hand because it means it's not available as a court of calling target. Um, there's some world, depending on the post sideboard configuration, where you could go for a win here by casting Yawgmoth, drawing a bunch of cards, trying to find a, an endurance as a free green creature that you could play. And then cord for your Zulaport cutthroat. Uh, oh, and this is this is a great off. line from Aria with putting the Zulaport cutthroat into play now, and then playing the land afterwards. That can potentially turn on court of calling for four to go get the Yogmoth. Sort of do the inverse 
of uh, of what of what we were just talking about. But and and I think this forces uh, this forces the hand from um, from Brad to to go and just cash that fatal push in on something way worse than a than a Yogmoth Thran physician. If I'm if I'm puzzling everything out correctly, this is going to be Arya's game, and it, once again, great play from Arya, not just going for the Yogmoth straight out because that would have run into the, the the thing that I had uh, mentioned of Brad fatal pushing Yogmoth, but. Here, Brad can creativity for two. Arya has the option to cord for a bowmasters, or you know, do something to disrupt it if she wants. But in, in any case, she's going to be able to untap with two young wolves, cutthroat, and four mana to cast a Yogmoth. So I, I see this as what you outlined, Jake, where Brad can combo, but the Yogmoth combo actually trumps it. And I think we're gonna, yep, we're gonna see a likely a court of calling for two here from Aria. Yep, that Orcish Bowmasters answer, uh, stop one of those, uh, Archon of Cruelties from coming down, and then the Yogmoth is, is gonna do its thing, and, and that's gonna, I think that's gonna be all she wrote. Very impressive stuff from both players. I think I think both players played this game really well from from each side. It just Aria Aria finding the way to 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 kind of weave through Brad's interaction and and set up a clean combo. I agree, Jake. Great match. Um, lots of unintuitive plays. Lots of opportunities where people could have kind of run from face first into a trap if they had been hasty or not thoughtful enough but uh you know true to form th these these are two great competitors and we saw some some really nice stuff uh resulting in the end of, of aria winning a close three game match there we go it's congratulations to aria karam chandani for uh closing that out and locking up her spot in the top four of mitko master